So hello, everybody. Welcome to the second press conference of the EGU General Assembly 2024. My name is Hazel Gibson. I'm the EGU's Head of Communications, and I'd like to welcome you all today to our uh, second press conference, PC2, titled Food Security, Water Woes and Tired Lettuce. Uh, we are very grateful to have three amazing speakers joining us today, both here on site in Vienna and online. Um, we will be processing through their presentations and then moving to the questions and answer period after all of the presentations have ended. So if you are joining us virtually at this time, please can you mute your microphones until the end of the presentations when we will be able to take your answers directly in the room. Um, we have, as I say, we are joined by three um, excellent speakers today. It was a difficult task to choose the presentations we wanted to select for this year's General Assembly, as it is the largest General Assembly that we have ever had, with just about 20,000 abstracts submitted earlier this year. So choosing the cream of the crop for our press conferences was a uh, difficult task, but one that we found very exciting. So I would like to introduce our uh, three speakers for today. The first is uh, Marian Kulpen uh, from the Environmental Science Group, Wagner University and Research in the Netherlands. Um, the second is Paloma Estiva, who is uh, from the Departamento de Agronomia Agaria. This is very Spanish and I apologize for my terrible Spanish pronunciation. Uh, from the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid in Spain. And the third is Thilo Hoffman, who is from the Center of Microbiology and Environmental Systems Science from the University of Vienna here in Austria. Um, I will hand over to our speakers now and we will uh, carry on with the presentation. So we will start with uh, Marin. Thank you so much. I hope I'm not too close. Um... The slides should be up in just a second. Okay. <laughs> Yes. So welcome. Uh, thank you that I can be here today. Uh, my, I will present uh, our uh, research on tracking real-time impact of climate variability and trade disruptions on water and food security. Um, my name is Marijn Gulpe and also my colleagues Hester Biemans and Ipe van der Velder are here in the room. And we work also with Christian Sidirius in uh, his base in Australia. Um, I work at Wageningen University in research and Maybe you'd like this. Is the microphone just try? Yeah, I think uh, we all recognize these types of headings in which we see that extreme events of uh, weather events have effect on uh, food production and water security uh, in countries themselves, but also having effect um, far beyond the country in other countries uh, because they are interlinked with each other via trade. This means that there is a compli complicated interplay between biophysical and non-biophysical factors when it comes to uh, food security, but also water security. For example, in 2022, after a heat wave in India, the government decided to ban exports of wheat to other countries uh, to keep food security for their own country safe. Uh, and this could have uh, effects for countries that are actually normally depending on this uh, exports. And also in Indonesia last January, we saw that there was um, lower rice production because of uh, heat and droughts. Um, and this, and now they are depending probably this year more on high on imports from other countries. And of course, we know that these events are happening and that they are interlinked with each other. But we most of the time only know it when it's happening and not, uh, or when it already happens and not we don't trigger it beforehand. So we feel like the global picture is missing. Um, we would like to, uh, we think that, there, that the, the picture of what, of which regions and countries are depending on other regions or country uh, is yet missing under current climate uh, events or uh, water risks. And therefore we de developed a hydrology production trade model with open access data and um, models that we already use, but also newly developed models. So in this presentation, I would tell you the basics of this model and then uh, highlight a few examples of which we have found with this model and uh, the challenges that we have faced uh, to, to be as accurate as possible and the ambitions that we have. So this model uh, is 
uh, is fed with uh, climate data, uh, which is um, which we download uh, the, uh, monthly from the Copernicus data store. Uh, there is, uh, and this is input for our global uh, production and hydrology model. And this model uh, includes several crops, including uh, wheat, mice, and rice. Uh, it divides between irrigated crops and uh, rain-fed crops. And with this model, we can, uh, yeah, actually answer what what is uh, what. Um, crops are affected by the weather events and what water challenges will come up with this in terms of water uh, quantity. And for the first, and, and this is then uh, the production of this, uh, the output of this model is then uh, production uh, numbers. And this is used for our trade uh, model in which we actually could analyze what does, uh, what does um, a production uh, a lower production mean for another region uh, or country. And this is for the first time that we try to uh, to combine the biophysical model of the food and water with a trade model and actually um, simulate the current situation and the near future situation. And we think it's important because we cannot depend on historic data anymore and historic trends um, because climate change is increasing the events. And at the same time, also trades patterns are changing all the time. Um, and also we feel like we can do it currently because there is uh, more data available and also on a uh, yeah, more recent data, like for example, the climate data is available every five days, uh, of, is uh, available with a lack of five days. Sorry, I have to say that like that. So I would like to, to give some examples of what we have been done. Uh, we started two years ago with developing this, this train of data and models. Uh, and since the end of uh, 2023, we actually um, in, yeah, started to analyze specific uh, events. So we saw, for example, the heat impact after a really cold winter in India and what in the north of India and what this could mean for the wheat production. And this, because if the uh, spring is shorter after uh, a cold winter, the chance is high that uh, wheat production will maybe partly fill or um, so we're trying to get a grip on this. So these temperature differences. Also, uh, snow patterns are changing in Central Asia. For example, this year there was uh, not much snow. And this is this means that also downstream, especially downstream, there will be more effects felt. Uh, but in the eventually the there came a lot of snow, so we saw that it's it was maybe partly uh, yeah less of a hazard than we we could maybe have uh, got into. And currently, we are uh, looking into the ongoing droughts in uh, Southeast Asia, and what this can mean for the rice production there. Um, for here, you see, for example, the 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 climate data that we use. So you can see on the on the right or the left for you, uh, the temperature. And that already in 2024, the other blue dots, the temperature is relatively high uh, compared to other years and also compared to 2023. And also the, the precipitation is already quite low um, in 2000 or actually relatively low uh, compared to other years for 2024. So this is ongoing progress and we are still uh, getting trying to get a grip on this. And that actually brings me to my next slide, because we face some challenges to, to come as close as possible to reality. Um, we have to simulate and understand the variability uh, as good as possible, because um, if we do long-term modeling, we, can, we look more at the averages of multiple years. And now we really have to look in what is happening in one specific year. Um, we validate our model uh, with Fowstad, but they uh, always um, show two years later the, or are having a lack of two years. So we really need to get a grip of what's happening now. Um, we have to handle the bias and uncertainty in using the latest data, like the climate data that I mentioned before. Um, we have to have our results quite fast and also understandable because we would like to be in front of a climate risk or food or security food security risk 
so that there's also still time to actually handle uh, or to, to take action. Um, and at the same time, reality catches up early because we are working at the current system. We will have um, our data will be validated quite quick. And this is actually also a benefit because we can, um, yeah, really easily then also think or really easy, relatively easy then also validate our chain of data and models. So our ambitions are that we would like to support support early anticipation of potential food and water security by identifying emerging uh, emerging stresses uh, on a national level um, and also have better and quicker understanding understanding of this complexity of trade but also biophysical components to understand this dynamic global food and water system um, and we would like to provide knowledge uh, required for national food and water security and also for policies, because you can be depending on your own, as a country, on your own food, uh, food uh, production, or you are depending on another country's uh, food production. But understanding how this really works with the climate hazards that can come, we, uh, we would like to have more knowledge and provide this as well. So thank you. Uh, this was my presentation. Thank you very much. We will now move to our next speaker, Paloma Esteva, who is our online participant. Please give us a couple of minutes to change the slides. Thank you for your patience. Okay, please proceed, Paloma. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm Paloma Esteve. I am Associate Professor at Universidad Politecnica de Madrid in the Department of Agricultural Economics. And the research I'm presenting is titled Challenges and Opportunities of using reclaimed water for agricultural irrigation in Spain, a hydroeconomic uh, analysis. And it has been developed together by um, colleagues here at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid in Spain and colleagues from, from the Stockholm Environment Institute and the Stockholm University. Uh, so the research I'm presenting today is a part of an ongoing project, the Reclamo project, in which we are exploring the role of reclaimed water reuse this is treated with wastewater that is given an additional treatment so that it can be reused for different purposes, in these cases, irrigation. So next slide, please. So the key messages uh, we got from this part of the research are that reclaimed water reuse can contribute to mitigate the negative impacts of water scarcity for farmers, especially in areas um, of big population concentrations where wastewater treatment plants have a high capacity, and especially when this water is used to irrigate high value added crops. Uh, however, the contribution of reclaimed water reuse is limited. Uh, it can be a part of the solution, but only a part of the solution. And also, it may entail some negative impacts uh, for downstream demands. So, next slide, please. So, what is the relevance of, of these results? Um, well, reclaimed water reuse is growing rapidly, being agriculture its main user. And currently there is an important push from public policies to promote wastewater reuse. And it is considered, uh, well, it, it is considered within the Sustainable Development Goal 6 targets. And it is also considered an important issue within circular economy approaches. So for example, it can contribute to nutrient recycling, or it can contribute to improve water quality and improve the ecological status due to more strict uh, water treatment. Uh, and at the same time, it provides an additional non-conventional water resource that can be used for different purposes and that can be really key in, in, in arid and semi-arid areas where water scarcity is a problem. So Spain is a leading country in terms of water reuse in Europe. Uh, about half of water reuse in, in the European Union uh, comes from Spain. But uh, at the same time, we are quite far from reaching our potential. So only about 10% of, of uh, treated with water is, is reused. So in this context, uh, next please. Um, in this context, uh, we are developing the Reclamo Research Project, which is funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science. 
And this project is exploring the role of reclaimed water reuse for irrigation, but we are focusing in two very distinct uh, cases. So one is the most uh, typical one uh, in coastal areas, but the other one is in an inland basin where water reuse has started to be implemented to substitute groundwater abstractions. Um, next, please. So this inland case is the case of the upper Guadiana Basin in central Spain. And in this basin, uh, during the second half of the 20th century, there was a large expansion of irrigation agriculture triggered partially by, by agricultural policies. And this large development was mainly based on groundwater resources. So this led to the overexploitation of the aquifer below and the degradation of, um, of the associated wetlands of Las Tablas de Daimiel, which have or had a high ecological value. So since the end of the 20th century, um, next please, um, different, uh, different policies and management plans have been developed to, to, control, uh, uh, to control and reduce uh, water abstractions aiming to recover the aquifer uh, and the wetlands. So within these policies, the most important measure has been the implementation of a water abstraction regime, uh, which implies a reduction, a uh, um, large reduction of water allotments for irrigation uh, for farmers. And also these allotments are revised annually. So as long as the water levels in the aquifer um, continue decreasing, these allotments are reduced for farmers. So next, please. And, and next again, sorry. Um, so um, these plans, which were mainly based on, on promoting a more efficient use of water and to reduce allotments, have not really succeeded in avoiding overexploitation. So in this context, some irrigation communities have started to reduce treated wastewater uh, for irrigation of woody crops in this case, mainly vineyards. And even if these farmers are just a minority at the moment there, there is an increase, uh, an increase in interest and increasing demands from other farmers and users to further develop in this area, reclaim water reuse. So current regulation in the basin allow reclaim water reuse, but only when it substitutes uh, groundwater abstraction rights. So, so that the total amount of water use uh, doesn't change. So in this context, we question what is the potential of reclaimed water reuse in this area? What can be the impacts, but also what can be, uh, what, what can be sorry, the impacts for farmers, but also what can be the impact on aquifer recovery? Next, please. So, we started analyzing economic feasibility. So um, previous research within this project showed that a project viability depends on location and on the type of crops. So there is a net benefit of reclaimed water reuse in areas close to high capacity water treatment plants. And, and especially when reclaimed water is used to irrigate high value added crops, uh, which is not uh, always uh, that way in this in this basin. Uh, so particularly when woody crops are irrigated as vineyards and olives, there's a clear net benefit on, on implementing this kind of projects. So uh, considering this, next please. Cons uh, and next, <laughs> considering this, uh, we developed first an economic model uh, that um, allows to simulate or to represent farmers' decisions regarding what crops to grow and what water resources to use. So it's an optimization model in which we assume farmers maximize their try to maximize their their farm income. So uh, this model allowed us to compare um, farm income under different conditions. So first we had the baseline conditions where water consumption is above sustainable levels. Then we simulated full compliance with the current water abstraction regime, where income would decrease by 5%. Uh, 
And finally, when farmers are given access to reclaim water reuse. So in this case, average, uh, the, the average farm income showed an increase of about 12%. Uh, so uh, what um, determines this, this impact or this positive uh, impact of reclaim water reuse? So first, the cost of water. And so here we consider the prices that currently farmers are paying uh, for reclaim water reuse in the small project that it's already been implemented there. So uh, in this case, the cost of reclaimed water is um, similar or even a bit uh, lower than the, than the cost of pumping water from the aquifer. So this is crucial there. So there, um, there's a, there arises the question of the role that uh, public uh, funding and subsidizing uh, water treatments um, are crucial for the for the viability of these kind of projects. Um, next, please. So then, um, building or, or or after seeing economically, it's positive or it can be positive for farmers. Um, then we we question what is the impact on the water system on the hydrology system. So for being able to explore the impact of these changes on the water system and on the aquifer, we couple a hydrology model in which we could simulate how different uh, land uses, different cropping patterns provided by different water allotments and access to reclaimed water reuse could impact on aggregated water demand and on aquifer water storage. Uh, next, please. So results showed that reclaimed water reuse would contribute to a stabilization of water levels in the aquifer. And despite its role is small, uh, it's an additional effort on top of a water abstraction regime. Also, uh, the changes in land use result on irrigation demands that are more easily satisfied when reclaimed water is available. Next, please. Um, however, the distribution of impacts on surface water bodies is uneven across the basin, and there can be negative impacts on downstream wetlands. Therefore, it's necessary to that reclaim water reuse is developed with caution, and more research is needed regarding the hydrological dynamics of the wetlands. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move to our last presentation which is with uh, Thilo Hoffman. Uh, give us a couple of minutes just to switch the slides. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work here. This is a joint project between the University of Vienna and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It fits perfectly to the talk before and you will see in a minute why. Thank you so much, that's perfect. <laughs> So the issue of the presentation is about uh, tires. You know that tires, they are highly designed. They contain a lot of chemicals and they're designed to abrade because you want to keep your car on the track. So they need to abrade, they need to have frictions. And it is no surprise that uh, tire contain additives because what a tire is doing nowadays, it's high tech. And this doesn't basically depend on the rubber itself. It depends on the additives inside the tire. And what has been overlooked over a few decades now that, of course, these additives end up in the environment. Uh, E-mobility will not change this picture. To the contrary, E-mobility has a higher weight and also abrasion of the tires might be a little bit higher. So E-mobility does not change this. Just to get a, a rough idea about this, it's about one kilogram per capita per year. So this is massive. And this is about a 50% of the global microplastic. So it's, it's a big number. What we have seen from other studies over here is this is a um, paper in Science uh, two years ago that these tire wear additives might be really toxic to fish. So, for example, after a, a street wash, road wash events in Seattle, basically a salmon was swimming uh, upside down in the river. So it's it's pretty toxic, this tire wear additives. I'd like to move this slowly here. And here we get the exact link to the last presentation. So how do, why do these tire wear additives reach the farmland soil? Normally you wouldn't expect to throw your tires, hopefully not to farmland soil. 
point is that you have uh, three big routes. The one route is biosolids, and here you have a map of the European Union, and you see, for example, in Spain, it's about 72%, or here in France, 76% of the sewage sludge, called biosolids, which because it sounds better. And this is brought to the fields, basically, for uh, being a fertilizer, because we have uh, a limit in some areas of organic carbon, but mainly phosphorus. And that's also why we used uh, a cooperation with Israel, because in Israel, uh, basically all of the biosolids are used. And this is increasing globally. So most countries in the world use increasingly biosolids. And these biosolids, of course, contain all the road wash from the roads, including the abraded tire wear. And the second route is exactly uh, irrigated wastewater. So this is reclaimed wastewater, as we just heard from Spain. This is increasing in the EU. This is also increasing... Uh, Globally, in Israel, for example, up to 100% of the wastewater is reclaimed, treated, and then irrigated to the field. And this is the two major pathways why the additives from the tire can then reach basically farmland soil. And the third part is wind. So if, if a motorway over here, of course, wind can basically uh, have an input here that you get the tire wear directly onto your farm field. Now it does not work at all. Oh, I have to bring the mouse back. So uh, we had three different studies, and uh, what we wanted to show is that the additives on the tire wear leach into the environment, they're taken up by plants, and they enter the food chain. So first step is we did a hydroponic study, so just in the lab to see and understand the mechanism. The second step was a monitoring study, so we checked all around Europe, basically. If you go to the grocery and buy this from Spain or the Netherlands or from where whatsoever, what do we find here in stock? And then the study we report today is uh, with Lucian Hemmeli, who's here in the audience, is a greenhouse study. So we wanted to look under realistic growing conditions, basically, what happens here. Experimental setup has been uh, very simple. Here are the pots in the greenhouse, nice lettuce. You just have seen the pictures. We dose the fertilizer, we dose the compounds over here. We were running these uh, experiments uh, 21 days. And then basically we extracted the salad, we extracted the soil and measured this at high resolution mass spec to identify these compounds. Uh, you don't need to know these structures by heart, even if you're a journalist, of course you will do so later, I know. But just look to how, how nice they look. And that's exactly what we did. We wanted to look to the structure. We selected by purpose very different structures because then you can extrapolate this to different compounds. And we also look to a parameter called hydrophobicity, how much they love water or they love fat. So these compounds here are very different. And this gives us a little bit an idea of what is the driving mechanisms. And it gives you a little bit of prediction what would happen with other compounds. Why? Because in a tire, you can have up to 1,000 of these compounds, and it's impossible to test the tox and the uptake of all of these compounds. Second, producers like Conti or Michelin or Pirelli, they will never tell you what's in the tire. That is the secret. Uh, and it's not regulated, by the way, which is interesting and might change in the next years. Um, plant uptake and metabolism. It's important. So uh, the first step is basically you need a root uptake. So your compound and, and with this fancy structures, that's not easy. The compound has to pass basically the root being taken up and different compounds behave very different. Then you have a distribution in the plant and then the plant actually wants to get rid of it. It does a metabolism basically. So it has detox mechanisms and this metabolism produces a lot of other compounds. What we see is one of these compounds, HMMM basically. So it is taken up in the plant. The concentration increases over time, uh, 14 days, and then it decreases again. So you have a metabolism in the plant. They say the same for diphenylguanidine, DPG. So it's taken up over here and then the concentration again decreases. So you have metabolism. Um, that's the work, what Lucian did. Uh, it's it's a little bit, a lot of explaining here with the arrow bars, but when we talk to the plant uh, guys, they tell us, well, that's nature. If you have a lot of different plants, data just looks uh, different. But what you can see is for the take-home mass. So some compounds here, you don't find them a lot in the plant later, but uh, degradation products of this compounds, this is, by the way, the toxic one, which kills the salmon, 6-PPD, and the quinone is basically the product which is later produced in the environment. They are taken up by the plant, and then also DPG and HMMM are taken up. The message here is very simple. These compounds are taken up under realistic um, growing conditions. 
the compound availability in the soil, so how much of this compound you have, the sorption behavior, as well as the plant uptake processes govern the concentrations in the leaf. So it's it's getting complex. And then the soil composition, of course, this is a no brainer. That's no surprise if you have a lot of clay, you have less, but you don't uh, grow salad and clay. So the soil composition, of course, significantly influences the compound uptake for all the studied tire derived compounds. And with this, I would like to um, show the team over here. So Lucian Hemmerle, he, he really did most of the work in Israel, actually, until October 8. Then he need to fly back. But he is here in the audience. And uh, Anya Sherman, she is a PhD student uh, in, in my department. Uh, this postdoc, Torsten Hufer, and me. And then the team from Israel, Benny Hafetz, uh, he's at the moment in LA, and Ivar Tarr. And I would like to close with a few takeaway facts uh, yeah, sharing is encouraged, of course, because it's a press conference. So I as a braid, very simple, one kilogram per year globally. It's massive. Tire particles contain a plethora of potentially toxic additives. Tire particle additives enter the farmland via biosolids, recycled wastewater, as we just heard, and wind. These additives leach into the soil. We have shown they are taken up by plants and enter the food chain. And under realistic conditions, compound structure and soil availability to control this uptake. And then it's my personal statement here. The risk to human health is not fully known, but please, guys, we don't want world life with PFAS, DDT, and the others until we see the risk. We need to act now and restrict chemical plastic pollution. That's really of major importance. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank you very much. So uh, now we have some time for questions. Um, I'm able to open the room for questions both, uh, sorry, yes, open the room for questions both in the room and online. If you are in the room, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. If you are online, you can either uh, use the raise hand feature in Zoom or type your question into the chat and I will ask it on your behalf. Um, so does anybody have any questions for our speakers? Yes. Thanks so much for your presentations. Um, I am curious about the tire emissions. So um, I'm in, from Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and I saw all those <laughs> headlines with the salmon a couple of years ago. Um, what are the worst compounds in from the coming from the tires that that you know of? And did I understand correctly that you said up to a thousand chemicals are in tires, but we don't know what those are? It's a very good question. So what is known from Oregon, for example, is 6-PPD, 6-PPD ketone, but often the 7-PPDs are now regulated. So for example, EPA, California does a lot of regulation on this. So there is a big debate both in the US as well as here in Europe, which of these compounds might be banned for substitutes. My concern here is that we have seen this substitution very often. For example, if you look to BPA and you can go to the supermarket in Oregon and buy BPA free bottles, beautiful, uh, and there is BPS inside, it's not better. Uh, long chain PFAS have been banned and substituted by next generation PFAS for shorter chain PFAS because they are thought to be safer. They're not safer. So I would go the other way around. I would go to the positive list here. I would really regulate this and go to a positive list and say, these are additives which are allowed. It sounds maybe a little bit naive, but I don't think it is naive if you look to the problems coming up in the last decade, better understanding that it is simply impossible to tox test all compounds, not possible. You need to go the other way around. Good follow up. Um so of the three uptake me mechanisms that you identified, biosolids, um, wind, and irrigation water, which of those is the most concerning? Yeah, very good question. Not, not easy because it's a wicked problem. The wicked problem is biosolids contain of course fertilizer so it's used a lot for example in the us canada china increasingly on the other side it is basically the sewage sludge with all the compounds which humans emit so uh, in europe there is a strong movement to ban sewage sludge for example this is done in switzerland already uk uses a lot but in germany and austria it's banned in future they move out of this what you can do is you can paralyze it hot temperature, no oxygen, to bring it as a 
uh, biochar basically to the field that's one option recycled wastewater same wicked problem we just had a talk from spain water shortage is increasing not in oregon maybe in some parts but uh that's a big problem so you need the recycled wastewater but then you need very intensive treatment which which is a problem for the cost the biggest problem might be next to road directly in the first 10 to 20 meters next to the road basically from the wind so there are a few techniques collecting these tire wear particles directly in this i don't know the term i would know it in german but not in english directly where the tire is inside this thing in the car where you can collect it and to try to first minimize abrasion of the tire that's possible greener additives and then minimum emission from the tires that that's really key I have one last question. I'm just curious um, if you notice um, any policymakers that are interested or moving forward on trying to do something related to tire pool based pollution and, and if there's a difference between US and Europe. This is happening heavily and interestingly, it is getting at the same speed. While I would say US was 10 years ahead of PFAS and 10 years slow in plastics for tire wear both like US and Europe is moving at the same speed. So I know from, because we're in contact with regulators from EPA in uh, California, it's going exactly at the same speed like regulation here in Europe. In the next European norm for cars, seven tires will be included and chemicals will be included soon. So yes, it's moving forward. People are aware of this. These compounds should not be there. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions either in the room or online? Hi. Uh, can I ask just a basic question, first of all, are these compounds, you're talking about them as microplastics sometimes, but also as additives, so are these are these all actual, are they actually types of plastic, or are they other chemicals, what, what exactly are we talking about here? Very, in very principle, like every plastic, it's formed out of a monomer, then you have a polymer or copolymer, but that's not plastic, that's the polymer to make out of a polymer a plastic you add additives there's no such thing like plastic without additives spinning anti-uv antioxidants whatsoever vulcanization additives and tires so whatever your plastic you have in your hand or whatsoever you have additives inside so we're talking of the chemicals which make basically out of the polymer the product you have of the versatility so i would pitch here that chemical pollution stemming from all plastics, not only tires, but also PVC and whatsoever, is maybe even the bigger problem than just mechanically having the plastic there. So all plastics contain additives. And this has nothing to do with size. So it's of micro or micro or nano, just from the nano, it leaches out faster than from the micro. And then I can also ask, how big a problem is this in terms of how much of this is in our food? Is anyone actually testing for it? Do we have any idea of sort of quantities or types or anything like that? Um, we tested this in salad from Spain, Italy, um, Austria, um, Switzerland, and Israel. And the concentrations have been very low for the few additives we tested. So concerning food, I would say too early to say there's no risk or high risk but food at the moment I, this might change in the next five years is not my highest concern inhalation is different because if you're living next to a road or we just debated here before because we are both climbers or bordling if you go to a climbing hall for example then you abrade the soles of your climbing shoes and inside a climbing hole basically the concentration in air of plastics is quite high and you inhale this so that's what we are testing right now in a, in a current project how much basically these additives uh, influence your gut and your lung microbiome what are the impacts of the humans I'm sorry, so what would it take to establish an effect i mean a, you know the, the, the these low concentrations here that sounds like maybe we shouldn't be worried i mean what what, what point do we say this is a serious problem or not I would say if I have a compound, and I'm just going back one row to Oregon, if I have a compound which kills after rain events salmon in a river, for me, the debate is over. You need to regulate this. 
it is toxic to fish. And this was just the start. And then we don't understand the mechanism. So we have seen that for one species of trout, it's not toxic. But the next species, it is toxic. So people are working now, what is the exact mechanism? Why is it so different, the tox from species to species? If I would say we have seen this for, let's say, maybe 10 species at the moment that is really highly toxic for the environment, I would say that that's enough. Stop it. We are just there to say it is a major problem. I, I just am curious, knowing that the plastic treaty negotiations are underway, yeah. and this seems like a huge percentage of the plastics that we need to be concerned about, is is a discussion specifically on tires happening with the plastics treaty? Do you, are you aware yeah, of that? Yeah, in AF 5.2, there's a specific discussion about this. And at the last step also, which I'm very happy about, chemicals came into in 5.2, which is really important. I'm sorry, just about the uh, how much how much more serious this problem has become. And have we got any sort of figures for how much the levels of these is increasing over time? If if we're using more biosolids, if wastewater has been recycled, how much more of a problem is this becoming? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I have to say the data I have seen is terribly bad. So we have seen. First reports from, correct me, two years ago in California that 80% of the plastics in air, 80% is tire wear. We have seen um, from data, University of Vienna, that um, tire wear particles can be transported over hundreds of kilometers in the atmosphere. But sampling is not easy, detection is not easy, and I would say we, we honestly don't have the data for this at the moment. But just to be clear, you think the problem is getting worse over time, not getting It worse. is, yes. With the uh, basically more cars being produced and more tires being abraded, it is very simple. You, you can do this and back on the envelope calculation. You know how much cars and lorries are out there. This is an increasing number. As I said, e-mobility is changing zero here. You still have tires on the road. So uh, the problem is increasing. And it's accumulating itself. Just a reminder for anybody online, um, feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question or drop it into the chat. Um, any last questions in the room? No? Just checking. Okay. So uh, thank you very much to all of our panelists today for joining us in this press conference. Um, this is the second of seven press conferences that we have this week. The next one is taking place tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., which is PC3, Unveiling Antarctica Secrets. New research brings us one step closer to predicting the future of the icy continent. So please feel free to join us either here in the room or online for that 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. Um, all that remains to say is if you wish to have any additional conversation with any of our three speakers, they will be available immediately after the press conference conference for additional conversation. Um, and if you need any help or assistance with other media materials during the course of the General Assembly, please visit media.egu.eu for additional resources and support. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I would like you to uh, join me in thanking our three speakers today for their excellent presentations. Thank you very much.